Good morning. Welcome to the worship of all God, Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. My name is Tyler Domsky. I'm the pastor here. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, my daughter painted my fingernails today. So if you see that in the service and are confused as to why I have rainbow fingernails, it's because my daughter painted them. I think she did a pretty good job. Thanks. Uh, but we're delighted that you're here and it's a great day to worship God together. So let's worship God. Thanks for being here. thought of us before the world began to breathe. You knew our names before we came to be. You saw the very day we fall away from you, and how desperately we need to be redeemed. Lord Jesus, come lead us. We're desperate for again come search our hearts and purify our lives we need your perfect love we need your discipline we're lost unless you guide us with your life Lord Jesus come lead us we're desperate for your time One of the joys in being together each and every week is being able to greet one another with the love of Christ. We do that even in this virtual space with the opportunities to reach out to one another, to uh, text each other, call each other, do whatever you need to say. I thank God for you. I'm glad you're in my life. Uh, and now's the time we do that. We can do that virtually with this great technology we have. So I would ask you to pause the video, text somebody, call somebody, do whatever you need to do to let them know that you appreciate them, that you're glad that God is in, the, in your life and let us pass the peace of Christ. Yeah. 
Each and every week we take time to recognize the ways in which God has blessed us, to know that God uh, has many gifts to give us, that God has, has gifted us each with different abilities, different interests, different uh, personalities, different ways in which we can communicate, different ways in which we can understand the world. And that God desires all of those to come together, that we work the best when everyone brings their best to this community. Uh, that the church is not a collection of individuals so much as it is uh, one body that is joined together. And we are made more uh, diverse and more um, capable of reflecting God when we have the diversity of thought and mind and ability and creativity and all of that stuff. So we call this offering. Offering often gets understood as financial giving. And financial giving is important, but that's not the only thing. Uh, if you do want to give financially, you can give directly to uh, the church online uh, by going to wexfordcpc.org slash give. It's a very easy way to do it. You could also send things directly to the church. They get deposited every week. But as I was saying, we need to recognize that uh, we're not just gifted financially and that God doesn't need our, our gifts. God re wants us to be involved in what God is doing. God wants the, the interests and the joy and the things that, that make our hearts sing, God gave us each of those for a reason and, and we can use that for the church. And if it doesn't fit into the, the way the church operates, then maybe think of a new way to fit it in. Maybe talk to us about how we can do something new because the church is not an artifact. The church is alive. The church is living and active and all things that are alive grow and change and develop and, and the church is no different. So your gifts are necessary for what the church needs to be, even if it's not that yet. So bring your gifts, help us uh, to be the church that we're supposed to be. And with that in mind, let us present to God our tithes and our offerings.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised us that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear our prayers now, O Lord, for the Church Universal, for this congregation, its mission, and its ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice, in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and the oppressed, for the bereaved and the lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Listen to the word of the Lord. Herod, the king, heard about these things, because the name of Jesus had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and this is why miraculous powers are at work through him. Others were saying, he is Elijah. Still others were saying, he is a prophet like one of the ancient prophets. But when Herod heard all these rumors, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised to life. He said this because Herod himself had arranged to have John arrested and put in prison because of Herodias, the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. Herod had married her, but John told Herod, it's against the law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias had it in for John, she wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. This was because Herod had respected John. He regarded him as righteous and a holy person, and so he protected him. John's words greatly confused Herod, yet he enjoyed listening to him. Finally, the time was right. It was on one of Herod's birthdays when he had prepared a feast for a high-ranking official, for high-ranking officials and military officers in Galilee's leading residence. Herod's daughter came in and danced, thrilling Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the young woman, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. Then he swore to her, Whatever you whatever you ask, I will give you, even as much as half of my kingdom. She left the banquet hall and said to her mother, What should I ask for? John the Baptist's head, Herodias applied, replied. Hurrying back to the ruler, she made her request. I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a plate right this minute. Although the king was upset because of the solemn pledge and, the, and his guests, he didn't want to refuse her. So he ordered the guard to bring John's head. The guard went to the prison, cut off John's head, brought him his head, brought his head on a plate and gave it to the young woman. And she gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a real hard passage. Um, it's actually interesting that it's even included in the lectionary. Uh, the lectionary is the kind of suggested texts for the for each week. Uh, it helps you over the course of time, over the course of three years, you kind of preach through the whole Bible, but also uh, it keeps you connected to other churches throughout the world that are preaching on the same stuff. That's why we talk about it a lot. And oftentimes the lectionary skips over the hard stuff. Uh, just like we do, just like regular life, we kind of skip over the hard stuff a lot of times. So it's really interesting that this text is in there. So I think it's a really interesting story and it's a, it's a good story for us to dig into, but it's a hard story. Um, 
So we've got we've got John the Baptist. John the Baptist, kind of one of the more important people in the gospel, uh, in terms of connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament, but also um, really foretelling uh, Jesus is coming and that this is a different kind of Messiah. And so John is arrested by Herod, not that Herod, the other Herod. Uh, there's a couple Herods. There's the Herod in the Christmas story and the Herod in the Easter story. Uh, the Herod in the Christmas story dies, and there's more Herods after that. It's like a, all the kings are named Herod. Um, and so the Herod in the Christmas story dies when Jesus is about two. That's when he comes back from Egypt. Um, so anyway, this, this Herod has married his brother's wife. His brother's wife is Herodias. And uh, it always makes me think of um, the play Hamlet, uh, the Shakespearean play Hamlet. And um, uh, it, there's a part in Hamlet where uh, the king uh, has murdered, sorry, this is a spoiler for a play that's 500 years old, so you've had your shot. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, the king murders his brother, who is the king. The, the king murders his brother, who was the king, by pouring poison in his ear. I don't, I don't know if that really works. Uh, and then he marries his wife. And so it seems like a similar thing here. It's not really clear whether Herod's brother died or Herod's brother is still alive and Herod just stole the wife away. Uh, nonetheless, Herod and his wife Herodias are, um, are married now. And John is saying that this is breaking the Levitical law, that this is uh, the rules against this and, and he's not allowed to do this. And so he's been kind of like going around telling everybody, standing on the street corners. John is just kind of a weird character anyway. I don't know if you remember this, but he wears camel hair clothes and eats locusts and, locusts and honey, lives out in the desert, kind of a weirdo. Uh, and so he's generally not socially acceptable, but he's also uh, running afoul of the king. And so, and the queen especially does not like this, does not like this guy who's standing on the corner saying that what they did is wrong. Uh, no one's gonna call them on it, no one's gonna do anything about it, but she still doesn't like it. So she decides um, that John should be arrested. She says to Herod, you gotta arrest that guy. John is arrested, John is in jail for um, speaking out against that union. And then we get to this part where it's Herod's birthday. Herod's throwing a big party. And Herod has uh, Herodias' daughter, which we can assume is the daughter of Herod's brother and Herodias, because uh, it doesn't say Herod's daughter. Um, but it could be Herod's daughter, too, because if you have multiple wives, then the daughters would be listed by their mother because they're all from the same father. Regardless, this is a weird, it's a weird story. Um, Herod is having a party, uh, and in the midst of his party, everyone's drunk, all the, all the guests are... are enjoying the party, and they have uh, his daughter Salome come out and dance. And she dances probably in the way that you're thinking, uh, in a way that makes a bunch of a uh, room full of men pretty excited. And they all lose their minds, and they're so excited about this dance, and they, and Herod makes this boast uh, in front of the whole um, gathered crowd, and says, that dance was so amazing. I will give you anything that you want, including up to half my kingdom. Like, it's kind of an overshoot. Uh, he's drunk. And so Salome doesn't know what to do. She goes to her mom and says, he said I can have anything I want. What should I do? She says to Salome, have the king, ask the king for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, on a platter, that's just kind of a ceremonial presentation of it to be overly dramatic. And so Salome, young girl, says this, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Uh, and Herod does not want to do this, but kind of has to because he's made this promise in front of everybody else. And then John is beheaded. The head is brought to Salome, who I imagine really has no idea what to do with this head. Um, and that's the end of the story. There's a lot of ways we can make a, a bunch of kind of interpretive gymnastics to try to say, see, that's how tyranny corrupts. That's how blah, blah, blah. Um, this is just a sad story. It's a sad story because it's pointless. It's pointless because nothing is achieved by this. Herod doesn't want to kill John. Uh, there's nothing gained by killing John, even though Herodias wants him dead. Nothing changes. 
uh, he was fine in the in the in the dungeon. Salome didn't want that to happen. Uh, John isn't martyred. There's nothing positive that happened. It, it, there's no response in the scripture after this that says, and then everyone was emboldened and did all this stuff. No, nothing good came out of this. We, we do a bad job of forcing tragedy into having some kind of meaning. And so it's important and it's helpful that there's stories in the Bible like this that have no meaning. Nothing happens out of this. The Bible doesn't try to spin this narrative into some kind of larger place within the gospel. It's just tragedy. The Mark version is the version that we read. Uh, it then goes on to the events of the Matthew version. But the Matthew version has one extra little bit. So right after this, in both of those versions, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 happens. So G Jesus goes out in the desert or, or goes off in the wilderness. People follow him. He preaches. And uh, after preaching for a while, people get hungry. Uh, we're going to talk about this next week. But uh, people get hungry. Disciples uh, get food. And Jesus turns it into a lot of food. And there you go. And then what happens after that is Jesus walking on water. All of that happens in both of these stories. But in Matthew especially, um, the important aspect of that is uh, Matthew adds one detail. And the detail is that after the death of John the Baptist, um, John's disciples go to Jesus and tell him what happened. Now John was Jesus' cousin. Um, John was, a, was really important in terms of... Uh, what he meant for this new um, covenant. But John didn't really understand who Jesus was. He says at one point, he, he sends word from prison to Jesus in Matthew and, and has his disciples say, are you the one? Are you really the Messiah? And uh, so he wasn't even really sure because he didn't really know what Jesus was going to be. He just knew that this was Jesus, but he thought it was going to look a little different than what it had looked at that point. So anyway, when the disciples go to Jesus and, and say John has died, Jesus' initial reaction is to go off by himself, to have time to, to mourn, to feel bad. And in Matthew's version of the story, it's when he goes off by himself that the people follow him into the wilderness. So Jesus going into the wilderness wasn't to preach, it was to mourn the loss of his friend, the loss of his, his cousin, mourn this tragedy that is pointless, mourn this world in which suffering happens that is pointless. In the midst of that, Jesus has compassion on the crowd and preaches to them and meets their needs. And then after that, he goes off by himself again. That's the reason why he's not on the boat when the disciples go across the Sea of Galilee. And that's why he walks on water. That's for next week. So what is this story telling us? Well, I think that there's one thing, when we look at the kind of the Matthew version, one thing that we can tell from this is that the model that Jesus gives us in the, in the midst of things that make no sense, in the midst of tragedy that we can't wrap, wrap our minds around, is that we need space. We need space to process. We need space to, to mourn, space to pray, space to be present with the pain without trying to apply reason to it. And a lot of times we like to push that off. Like I said, we, much like the lectionary, like to skip the, uh, the difficult stuff. We like to uh, kind of push past it, act like it doesn't matter. But we need to make space for it. No, it doesn't, we don't really hear anything else about it after this. It's not that it, it changed Jesus's dynamic, but he takes time to recognize it. I really appreciate this passage because it's a time in the Bible, in Scripture, that makes room for tragedy. I think we oftentimes, uh, at least in kind of popular culture, popular Christian culture, it seems as though we want to apply meaning to everything and we want to uh, proclaim God's plan 
uh, to be perfect. And for it to be perfect, that means everything happens for a reason. I think that God's plan is perfect and God's plan can be perfect, but that doesn't mean that everything happens for a reason. That doesn't mean that God needs everything to happen the way that it does for everything to happen the way that it does. And that's an important distinction because that if, if you have God needing people to die, if you have God needing the tragedies in the world to happen, then you have a God who needs the Holocaust to happen, who needs uh, infants to, to die and suffer, who needs tragic things to happen. God does not need that. And that's an important part of understanding who God is. Because if you start to think that everything happens for a reason, a lot of stuff happens for a reason. Almost everything happens for, well, yes, everything happens for a reason. And a large one part of those reasons is that God lets it happen. But that doesn't mean God wants it to happen. Those are two very different things. A big part of the story of God and humans that we first hear in Genesis is that God desires us to love God. But the thing about love is that you can't force love. It has to be given, which means it has to be chosen. And so when we ask, well, why did God put the, the tree there? Why did God put the tree that had the fruit that God didn't want us to eat? It's a great question. The best answer I've heard for it is because God wanted us to choose whether or not we loved God. And if that tree's not there, we don't get to make that choice. And if we don't make that choice, then the love isn't real. God does not want us to eat the fruit, but God allows us to eat it. By allowing a world in which we can choose life, you have to allow a world in which we can choose death. And by allowing a world in which there's death, you allow tragedy. And so the tragedy that God allows doesn't fit into God's plan any more than that's a byproduct of choice, which is a byproduct of love. Love, true love exists because we are able to choose it. And if we have that choice, then we can choose against it, which leads to tragedy. So I don't think that God wanted John to die, but I also don't think God wanted Herod to die. I don't think God wants anyone to die. Sometimes things don't make sense. A lot of life is like that. The problem is when we present a gospel or a biblical narrative in which everything makes sense, and if it doesn't make sense, then we just don't understand it right then we create a God who is uh, pretty terrible. We create a faith that has no room for tragedy. And we create a false faith that has no room for doubt, no room for mourning, no room for suffering, and no room for pain. We can see from scripture that there is great suffering, that there is great pain, that there is great mourning. We have a third of the Psalms are laments. A lament is just saying, this is terrible. God, where are you? This is terrible. I don't know what to do. A third of the prayers in the Psalms are laments saying, where are you, God? Not false, like, oh, God, I know you're here, but I just can't see you. Like, actual angry at God, yelling at God. The book of 
uh, Ecclesiastes, this book we have in the Old, Old Testament. The whole book is, the point of the book is, this is all meaningless. In the Bible, it's just saying, life is pointless. What are, what are we even here for? This is stupid. Everything we do is dumb. I could make all the money in the world. I'd die still just like the poor guy down the street. I could learn everything there is to learn. I'm still going to die like that dummy down the street. <laughs> like there, what's the point? That's the whole book. The very, very end. It basically, here's the very end. The only hope is like, but that's it. That's pretty much it. The whole book is meaningless, meaningless. Everything's meaningless. But maybe... Maybe God's there. That's why we never talk about Ecclesiastes. That's why we never preach on it. In the lectionary, there's only one passage from Ecclesiastes. It's to everything there is a season, a, a time to live, a time to die, a time to appraise, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to give, a time to take. Like that, the, the bird song, the turn, 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 that's from Ecclesiastes. That's the only part of Ecclesiastes we talk about because the rest of Ecclesiastes is a big fat bummer. And we don't like big fat bummers in church. But that book is important because it helps us to know that when life is a big fat bummer, God still has place for you in the story. It's important for us to have stories like John the Baptist dying, which is a pointless story that is a tragedy where human folly and human arrogance kills someone for no reason. That power is abused and people die for no reason. And that's essential to the gospel because that's how life works. Not all the time. The joy and the life and the, and the forgiveness and all of that and the hope and, and the celebration, that is also part of life. But we have to make space for the tragic stuff that makes no sense because life is filled with it. If you don't make space for that, then how do you explain the, the collapse of the apartment building in Florida? in the past month? How do you explain the hurricanes that come? How do you explain wildfires? How do you explain uh, the, the um, infant deaths? How do you explain any of these acts of God? Or the fact that uh, there are these monstros monstrosities of, of human uh, doing, like the Holocaust or like uh, the, the oppression and persecution of minorities and, and uh, especially the, the dis destruction and elimination of minority groups in, in other countries, including this one. Where is the room for that in the gospel? If we don't have stories like this. So what's the good news in that? Well, the good news is that that's not the end of the story. The good news is that God is big enough that God has space for tragedy, that God still can use us when things don't make sense and that God is still there. God is present in this story. This is not the end of the story. This is the middle of the story. Uh, I, I was told by a friend of mine one time, he quoted somebody else. I don't really know what the quote is, but he, uh, he said, everything works out all right in the end. And everything, if everything's not yet all right, then it's not the end. Very simple, but incredibly helpful. Uh, it's helped me through a lot of things. When, when things have been dark, when things haven't made sense, I haven't put my energy to trying to make it make sense. I just rest my, uh, my hope in the notion that this too shall pass, that this is not the end. We know the end and the end is good. We know that God loves us and God does not want any of us to die. And that even though death comes to all of us, God has wiped that away for all people. And so the tragedy of this story, the tragedy of all the stories, it is replaced by life. It is undone by the cross and even more so by the new heaven and new earth. That the hope we have is not simply that there will be no more pain, but that all the pain is erased. Because the suffering that we would have going forward, if you think of like some of the suffering that you've had, uh, some of the worst suffering we still have is, is mourning the loss of things that aren't there. We won't be mourning anymore. We won't be suffering anymore. We won't be lamenting the, the tragedies that have happened in the past. Those will be erased. Those will be wiped out. That's the good news. The good news is not that there is no tragedy. The good news is that the tragedy 
is not as big as God is. The good news is that God is with us even when things don't make sense and that God mourns with us, that God, upon hearing of the death of John the Baptist, that God in human form took time for sadness, time to mourn, time to make space to allow his emotion to be real. As we go through life, hiding our emotions, hiding our sufferings from people, let us not hide them from God. Let us not be afraid to lament. Let us not be afraid to yell at God because God is bigger than our sufferings, bigger than our anger, and God can take it. Let us know that God is not making these bad things happen, but that God loves us enough that God has allowed for us to choose God, but also allowed for us to choose away from God. But that that's not the end. God is not satisfied with that suffering. God is not satisfied with the, this flaw in the system that allows for tragedy. God is going to fix that. God is going to reconstruct and rebuild and erase all of that. As we go through hardship, let us know that we don't suffer these things alone, that God is with us and that others have suffered these things too, that we don't have to make sense of everything. We just need to know that God mourns along with us, that God takes time to let the emotions be what they need to be. Sometimes things don't make sense. But that doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. Sometimes it feels like everything is pointless. But that doesn't mean that God isn't still working. Still telling a story that's better than the one that we tell ourselves. Still making a story that's about rescuing us and not abandoning us. Let us know that and let us not be blind to the sufferings of others. Let us be the hands and feet of God, the heart of God in opportunities that we have to do that. Let us be the helpers. Let us not just mourn tragedy as though it's something that we can't control or something that, well, maybe God will do something good with this. Let us be part of the solution. Let, let us let God use us in ways that help others to know that they are not alone. And let's not try to make sense of it. The worst thing you can tell someone when they're going through tragedy is, well, maybe God needed this to happen. Because I can tell you, God does not. God does not rejoice in suffering. God does not delight in suffering. God does not need suffering. God loves us. And God's action throughout history is to reconcile us, to restore us, to return us, and to rescue us from ourselves. Let us know that there is hope even in the midst of things that don't make sense. Amen. You don't answer all my questions but you hear me when I speak you don't keep my heart from breaking but when it does you weep with me you're so close that I can feel you when I've lost the words to pray no, my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say, I know that you are good, I know that you are kind, I know that you are so much more than what I leave behind, I know that I am Even in the 
is overwhelming but I don't carry it alone you're still close when I can't feel you I don't have to be afraid and though my eyes have never seen you I've seen enough to say I know that you are time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this place to go back to our regularly scheduled lives, to be present with the people that God has put in our lives this day, to experience the joy and the wonder and the adventure that God has for us this day. Let us go forth knowing that there is tragedy in the world, that there are things that just don't make sense, and there are some things that we won't be able to understand. Let's not tell the false narrative that God needs those things to happen, that God uh, is causing that tragedy to create goodness. Let us know that God loves us, that God does not want that tragedy to happen, but that God is working throughout history to undo that tragedy, to erase it to a point where there is no more suffering. There is no more memory of the suffering that has come before, that all things are made new. That is the hope that we have. That is the story that we have. A God who doesn't abandon us, a God who loves us even in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. So let's go from this place with hope. Let us go from this place with joy, even if we go to a place that is not overjoyed at the moment. Let us go from this place knowing that we can be the helpers, that we can be people who, uh, in the midst of tragedy, show the face of God to those who need to see it the most. So let's go. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great day. Uh, do good things. Enjoy the world that's around us. Uh, let somebody paint your fingernails, I guess, uh, if you have someone who's interested in doing that. And um, 
make the most of this week because it's a gift. And there's some great things that God has to show you this week. I'll see you later. I'm going to awkwardly stand up now. Have a great week.